A researcher's mental health gradually deteriorates as he awakens to the horrifying realization that he's the sole inhabitant of a desolate, lifeless earth, knowing he could be the one that caused it. As the sun rises, Zack Hobson dreams of flying towards a bright light before waking up. Confused, he looks out the window and sees the fine day outside. Soon, he heads off to work, bringing his tape recorder along. After leaving the motel, the man stops at a gas station to refuel. However, he finds no cashier to accept his payment. He wanders around and observes several signs of life, but not a single person is in sight. As he continues his drive, he encounters deserted cars littering the roads. Agitated, he decides to break into a house to check if anyone is inside. Upon entering, he finds evidence that people were present, but it's as if they suddenly vanished. He drives away distracted by the strange situation and nearly hits a tanker truck obstructing the road. Zack checks the vehicle, unsurprisingly, no one's inside. He attempts to use the radio, but there's no response. In the city, there's zero foot traffic and abandoned cars all over. The man heads to a high vantage point and notices smoke rising in the distance. He drives towards it and discovers that an airplane used in his research facility has crashed there. Upon arriving at his research facility, Zack discovers that it's deserted. He attempts to contact other international branches but gets no response. While exploring the abandoned facility, he stumbles upon a message left behind that reads, Project Flashlight will proceed as scheduled. Surprised at this development, the researcher visits Perrin, the scientist controlling Project Flashlight. However, upon turning him around, he's already deceased and disfigured. Repulsed, Zack shoves the body and inadvertently activates some of the lab's emergency controls. This triggers an alarm and he rushes to the exit. Unfortunately, he fails to make it out in time. Determined to escape, the researcher creates a makeshift bomb. He sets it up and, while waiting for it to detonate, logs his activities on his recorder. He plays back some of his words, narrating the potential catastrophic consequence of their project and his discovery that information was being withheld from their side. Knowing this, he had decided on a course of action to end Project Flashlight. The researcher then updates his logs, narrating that Project Flashlight has malfunctioned. He also details his current predicament of being the lone survivor on Earth and his struggles at the facility. Moments later, the makeshift bomb detonates, allowing him to escape. Afterwards, he heads to a radio station and broadcasts his communication details, hoping to make contact with other survivors. As time passes, Zack resorts to various means to entertain himself. Eventually, he decides to make use of whatever resources and luxuries that were left behind. While admiring one of the paintings in his new home, he suffers a brief hallucination but ultimately disregards it. The lone man indulges in the luxuries of his new lifestyle, but the isolation starts taking a toll on his mental health. As he considers taking his own life, the TV delivers a broadcast, seemingly discouraging him from doing so. Desperate for interaction, Zack creates a makeshift soundboard to amplify his voice and mimic the sound of a crowd for his audience of cardboard cutouts. To the listeners, he confesses his own corruption and how he contributed to the creation of destructive forces. The researcher admits to staying silent in exchange for money and status, then tearfully declaring himself as the ruler of this doomed planet. Suddenly, the power in the city fails, leaving the unhinged man in complete darkness. The next day, Zack's mental state dances between self-destruction and self-preservation as he roams the empty city. He engages in destructive behavior while also maintaining normalcy by setting up his power generator and gathering supplies. There are also times when his paranoia and anxiety get the best of him, wary of sudden noises. The researcher sits at his computer, monitoring environmental conditions. He notices the levels of ultraviolet rays are higher than normal and notes to keep an eye on them in the future. Suddenly, he hears a noise behind him and turns around to see Joanne pointing a gun at him. After introductions, they share a warm embrace, both grateful for the human connection. Zack listens as Joanne shares her story of survival and the discovery of a deceased, fly-ridden body. He realizes that the possibility of survivors and the presence of other organisms means that there may be hope for the world yet. Together, they set out to explore the world, hoping to find other survivors and undercover the truth about everyone's disappearance. Soon, he notices that his companion has fallen asleep and tucks her in. The following day, while driving to the city, they come across more bodies who seem to have survived the effect. The two continue on, and Zack uses a device to check the sun, but they notice nothing unusual. As they settle in for the night at a motel, Joanne suggests they check places where people may have been unable or unwilling to leave, such as prisons or asylums. 
The researcher remarks that it's better to not find anyone if that's the case. During dinner, the atmosphere between him and Joanne is unusually tense. Zack breaks the silence by asking where they would be sleeping for the night. She responds by pointing out her sleeping spot, leaving him disappointed. The next day, they continue their search, but realizing they could cover more ground if they split up, Joanne and Zack reluctantly go their separate ways. The scientist hands her a walkie-talkie, and she reminds him to check in every half hour. Joanne searches a hospital, while Zack heads to a science university to use their equipment. Later, both of them experience a hallucination. Concerned, Joanne contacts Zack for his location. The researcher lies, unwilling to reveal that he's still at the university conducting experiments. During lunch, Joanne is taken aback to learn that Zack's research facility might be linked to everyone's disappearance. The researcher is uncertain, but he shares that they were conducting experiments on wireless charging for aircrafts, attempting to eliminate the need for fuel. He clarifies that his facility was one of many around the world, all conducting experiments. It's also possible that no one is responsible, or it could be an act of God. Soon, Joanne reminisces, saying she misses the wonderful noise of life around them, and Zack comforts her as she cries. The next day, he's jolted awake by a ringing phone. He answers, only to hear Joanne pretending to be room service. She enters and serves breakfast, but as she turns to leave, Zack sees something more appetizing. Later, they race through the city, still searching for survivors. However, Zack isn't really interested in looking for others, instead using his time away from Joanne to log his findings. After his experiments at the university, he comes to the conclusion that the universe has become unstable. When Joanne radios in, Zack informs her that he's on his way. While driving, he takes a detour to avoid a truck, but ends up on more obstructed paths. As Zack backs out of an alley, another truck rolls out and blocks his way. He exits his car cautiously, armed, before approaching the truck. When the researcher opens its door, an armed masked bandit emerges and takes Zack's weapon. The bandit asks if he's alone or if he has seen any other survivors. Zack remains silent and denies both. The bandit searches him before removing his mask, and just when he lowers his gun, Joanne's voice is heard through the walkie-talkie. Appy, wary of Zack's lies, disables the walkie-talkie and forces him to meet Joanne. At the plaza, Joanne is glad to see her companion. From a distance, Appy observes and then approaches them, dropping his weapon. Ecstatic at finding another survivor, the three share a hug. That night, they camp momentarily as they make their way to Appy's home. The scientist is amazed to see that they have caught some fish. While waiting for the fish to cook, the newcomer shares the story of how his friend tried to drown him. As he lost consciousness, he saw a light and began to drift towards it. However, before he could reach it, he woke up with his attacker gone. Joanne shares that she had a similar experience. While drying her hair with a hairdryer, the blower shorted and electrocuted her. She then felt drawn towards the light, but ultimately unable to reach it. The scientists suggest that they survived because the effect occurred at the exact moment they were between life and death. Zack also recalls the morning he overdosed on his medicine, but decides to keep that memory to himself. Soon, they finally arrive at Appy's home. While dancing, Zack privately asks Joanne her thoughts on Appy, and she replies that she thinks he's great. He confides in her that he used to be a loner, but meeting Joanne has changed that. She responds that they are a team of three now, subtly declining Zack's romantic advances. She then goes over to Appy and asks him to play a song that they can all sing together. Later that night, Joanne has another hallucination and goes outside for some fresh air. She sees Appy solemnly singing by a grave and decides to give him some space. The following morning, the scientist continues his observations of the sun, this time noting that it's due to collapse, resulting in the destruction of everything around it. Afterwards, he spots Joanne and Appy exercising in the distance. During their run, Joanne starts talking about attraction, explaining that people decide whether they're attracted to someone within seconds of meeting them. She goes on to say that any reasons given after the fact are just excuses to validate the emotions, or even to justify the attraction despite a person's evil deeds. Appy then teases that she likes him. She smiles and instead asks why his friend tried to drown him. Appy reveals that he killed his friend's wife, but insists that it was necessary before leaving her behind. Joanne chases after him, demanding to know who decided it was necessary and when, but Appy ignores her. Distraught, she decides to head back. Zack is busy packing things into the truck when he notices that Joanne is in a somber mood. Unaware of what just happened, the researcher starts to report about the sun's imminent destruction, but she's too emotional to listen. Appy appears, concerned by the heightened voices. As Joanne storms off, Zack informs him that they need to keep going north, 
saying he'll explain as they go. The newcomer challenges Zack, sarcastically asking if he's in charge, to which the scientist boldly affirms. He then demands to know what caused Joanne's sudden change in mood. When Appy gets violent, the researcher shoves the recorder in his face, saying it'll explain everything and drives off. Furious, he gets into his own jeep and gives chase. As he passes by Joanne, Appy asks if she'll ride with him. She refuses, saying she wouldn't even if he were the last man on Earth. During the chase, Appy listens to some of Zack's recordings, which explains that Project Flashlight is still active and somehow affecting the sun. Meanwhile, Joanne gets into her own car and joins the chase. Eventually, Appy manages to push Zack's truck off the road and Joanne arrives just as the men are about to fight. Joanne grabs Appy's weapon and shoots at them, ending the altercation. The researcher then confesses that Project Flashlight has been troubling him for a long time, enough for him to end his life. However, the effect spared him. As they drive back to Zack's headquarters, Appy expresses his disdain for Project Flashlight and their attempt to manipulate the universe. Most of all, he knows Zack's tendency to lie, unwilling to take what the researcher says at face value. Later, Zack and Joanne analyze data on the computer while Appy listens to the rest of the recordings. Based on the information they have gathered, the researcher believes that tomorrow morning, the effect will occur again. Suddenly, they all experience hallucinations and, this time, gravity is also affected. The ordeal causes Joanne and Appy to reconcile. Meanwhile, Zack rushes back inside, explaining that what they experienced was just a tremor of the effect. Appy proposes a plan to use explosives to destabilize the grid, which surrounds Earth, created by Zack's research, and eliminate Project Flashlight's power source. Later, the group breaks into an explosives warehouse and leaves with a truck full of explosives. While loading, Zack speculates that the effect and the grid may not be related, given that the effect seems to repeat without anyone activating it. The researcher ponders over the possible causes of the effect and wonders if it was a cosmic event or just a hallucination. He even questions the existence of Joanne and Appy, suggesting they could just be his imagination. However, as he approaches the car, Zack announces that he believes the cause to be the grid. He believes that among the possibilities, this one has the most potential to be true. As they drive to the research facility, the researcher wonders about the future if they succeed in saving the sun. Zack then confides feeling like a third wheel when he's with them. Joanne clarifies that she has feelings for both of them, though Zack knows she prefers the other man. Joanne then mentions the reason why the newcomer was being killed by his friend. Appy rejected his friend's wife's romantic advances, so the woman ended her life, making Appy feel responsible. This situation led to his friend's attempt at revenge. Zack alludes that he'll be able to manage his feelings regardless of who Joanne chooses. She kisses him on the cheek. Distracted, they almost crash into the abandoned tanker from earlier. The pickup manages to squeeze through one side of the road. Fortunately, Appy is able to stop his trailer truck just in time. After some consideration, Appy elects to push the tanker off the road and Zack cautions him to be careful. Appy nudges the tanker a few times until he creates a small gap, then speeds past it. Joanne decides to ride in the trailer truck after the dangerous maneuver. As they drive on the road, Appy decides to have fun by driving recklessly. He even turns off the radio to frustrate Zack. Eventually, the smaller vehicle manages to pass and the explosive truck comes to a stop. Inside, Joanne and Appy hold hands, enjoying the moment. Zack walks over and informs them that it's unsafe to get any closer to the lab due to the high concentration of energy caused by the grid. While observing the facility from a safe distance, the researcher remembers his radio control unit able to operate the explosives truck remotely, so he quickly heads off to retrieve it. Joanne rushes after him, offering to accompany him back to the city, but he declines. Having made his decision, Zack leaves the two to fetch his device. With Zack gone, the two spend their privacy intimately. As they lay there in each other's arms, Appy shares that he's prepared to drive the explosives truck into the dangerous zone if the remote control unit fails to work. Joanne expresses her concern, but before she can say more, they hear a familiar sound. They rush to the window and see the explosives truck barreling towards the facility. It dawns on them that Zack was planning to sacrifice himself all along, lying as usual. Soon, the effect begins. The weight of the truck causes it to fall directly into Perrin's lab and Zack uses his final moments to detonate the truck of explosives. As the world around him fades to white, the researcher feels weightless and sees a blinding light. Moments later, he finds himself on a tranquil beach as Saturn rises. Mesmerized by the surreal sight before him, Zack holds his recorder. 
he walks towards the waves, unsettled by the strange new world he's found himself in. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.